Okay, so I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. My name's Mark Eldridge. I'm the Divisional Director at Kiwa Gas Tech and Electrical Compliance. Kiwa is one of the leading providers of hydrogen services in the UK and across the Kiwa Group. Today's webinar is presented by Mark Crowder, Kiwa UK Technical Director on the future of gas boilers. It forms um, the start of a, a wider webinar series, which will be hosted by Kiwa um, in the coming months. Just as a, an, an overview of this, the webinar series as it stands um, will take a, a format of a webinar per month. We'll basically start today with the future of gas boilers and provide a, a holistic overview. We'll then move into January where we'll touch on the hydrogen safety in homes. Then we'll move into to February, developing safe hydrogen appliances, touching then on hydrogen domestic conversion, the development of hydrogen hubs, hydrogen quality for transport and heating, and then we'll sort of have a bit more of a general overview in terms of hydrogen projects uh, and, a, and a general perspective on transition um, in June of next year. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box via the tool on your screen. We'll look to respond to as many of these as possible, maybe not at the end of the webinar, but if we don't get time for that, we'll basically send out a PDF of all the questions asked. It will be anonymized um, with the answers to those questions. This presentation will take around 30 to 40 minutes and uh, we'll basically fo follow on with our responses at the end of the webinar. Now we'll turn our time over to Mark Crowder. Our presenter today has been a leading voice in the UK on hydrogen for some time. He's technical director for the Hyper Heat Programme funded by Bayes within the Arab Plus Consortium and has a wealth of experience across a variety of UK projects, including the initial conception of H21, H100 consequences, lever mouth feasibility work, high deploy at Kiel and H2GV and a wider network consortium. He set up Kiwa Gas Tech on the back of the coal research establishment and has worked on both large scale consultancy, expert witness under notified body status and is active across the UK and Europe on a field of hydrogen. He has a background in chemistry and chemical engineering from Oxford and Imperial College, a chartered gas engineer, and I'm sure you'll enjoy his overview of the future of gas boilers this morning. Over to you, Mark. Good morning. And thank you very much indeed for a, for a, for a kind introduction there, Mark. Um, there are a number of Marks at uh, Kiwa Cheltenham, and it's rather confusing. We have to always get, give the surname as well. So where are we? Um, this is the, the, the slide you'll see in front of you is uh, HMG's latest publication on the 10 point plan, which indicates go, uh, gas and oil boilers will be banned, from new, if banned in new builds from 2020. Well, the original document I think said 23, but no, no, that was a typo and it's now 2025, but it's still not a, it's quite, it's a short period of time in terms of business, um, company business planning. There are at the moment about 24 million homes in the UK running on gas and about, about 160,000 homes a year. So what are the options to meet stringent green targets? So next. Um, this is Kiwa. This is our expertise in hydrogen. It's one of those classic wheel wheels and you can see that we deal in, in most areas. So we do feasibility studies. In Cheltenham, we don't do very much fundamental research. We do um, sort of big picture research, but we don't do actually a plants research. Um, but we do do consultancy for people like the GDNOs, people who are interested in getting into hydrogen, want to understand the hydrogen um, uh, marketplace. And as you can see, all those areas around there, storage, delivery network, production, fuel cells, um, our Dutch colleagues have a wide range of test facilities, for example, for high pressure hydrogen tanks. Um, we ourselves test hydrogen appliances. We're very much plugged into the whole of the hydrogen landscape. And that's particularly with reference to safety because obviously our background in, in the gas appliance um, directive and then more recently the gas appliance regulations and even more recently the UK CA mark. So start at the beginning, where are we? This is what the government's um, latest plans are in terms of this is the detail that was published alongside the green paper that you saw there, which gives actual numbers. So we've got a billion pounds towards construction of four new carbon capture and storage plants. 
confirmation of over a billion pounds in funding to make further progress delivering the government's commitment to invest in energy efficiency um, and 160 million to upgrade port side manufacturing facilities for, off for offshore wind farms but most important to us is the 240 million to support industries to produce low carbon hydrogen at scale and 80 million to test its use in heated buildings and we think that this shows a, a genuine commitment by the government to at least investigate hydrogen and I think it was in the last week one day that um, uh, our Prime Minister a little bit went off script and um, talked enthusiastically about hydrogen towns and, uh, and various other developments in the, in the reasonably short term. Um, they're also going to spend 525 million on large-scale nuclear projects, though to be honest, 525 million doesn't go very far in that sector. If you think that Hinkley Point C is going to be 23 billion, billion it's hard with nuclear to get the noughts in the right place that's about a thousand pounds a house that means that that means that every house in the uk has got to pay a thousand pounds towards funding just one nuclear power station um one of those little accessed graphs which people might note is that this is from bayes need data and this shows the actual energy efficiency effect which has been um, gleaned from analysing real people's energy bills for energy measures that were installed in 2017. It's terribly easy for people to say, oh, well, all we need to do is to upgrade our housing stock and insulate it. But if you see there that the average condensing boiler or the condensing boiler installed in 2018 only saved between sort of four and six percent energy. That's not surprising because obviously we're beginning to replace some of the early condensing condensing boilers with further condensing boilers. But nevertheless, it's still it's not a big number. Cavity wall insulation you can see between six and eight again. That's because it's a lot of it's taken in comfort taking. Loft insulation is even less. Solid wall insulation, yes, that does make a material change, but even that's what less than 20%. Um, and you have to start sticking solar panels on the roof. To be able to make to, to really do anything better than condensing boilers cavity wall or loft um, and these are nothing like if you think by 2050 uh, hmg is promising zero carbon um, these while significant um, are, are i wouldn't say in any way they were game changers which is why really the hypothesis of my hypothesis today will will be you need to decarbonize the fuel so Bayes is still very much keeping its options open and Hygium must continue to try and get demonstration sites up and running. As I've said before, HMD is still talking about banning new natural gas connections by 2023-2025. Um, and that's one of the great reasons why I'm very supportive of the idea of convertible appliances. I was a bit hesitant to start off because of their complexity, but clearly a number of manufacturers of you out there have really cracked that problem. Um, and I mean, yes, the, uh, the whole idea of the HHIC being offered to government, the idea of, yes, you can put in switchable hydrogen appliances, I'd have thought must make it very attractive. Clearly, uh, with that banning of um, future new connections and with the sort of, sort of mood messages that will give, you could see boiler sales being reduced by, by 20% or something like that. So where are we? Um, well, up to 20% hydrogen, 7% carbon saving is coming next year. Um, we were closely involved in the uh, in the Caden project um, for, for high deploy. That seems to have gone well, but I mean that is only a 7% carbon saving. So, um, in the grand picture, is it curtains for natural gas? Well, I don't believe it is. That's what um, that's what today's hypothesis is all about. Should your company move swiftly into all electric products at the, um, at the inevitable loss of everything else? No. Well, let's look at why not. Um, yes, so the world is not short of potential renewable energy. People who've seen me lecture before will have doubtless seen my next slide. But I mean, all you need is an area sort of half the size of an Australian sheep farm and you could produce all of UK energy and uh, final energy end, uh, end needs. What we need is a reliable, modest, modestly priced energy vector moves energy from point of production to and transfer to the consumer. And historically, such sort of separation has enabled transparent markets, which is very hard with electricity. The separation of production from use improves the efficiency of both. 
Ideally, the vaccine should be non-poisonous or a short life. Ideally, no greenhouse gases emitted at point of use, which is why I think it's, that it's down to either electricity or gas. But a la and that's one I have added, it's unrealistic to think low carbon energy can ever be cheaper than, than fossil fuels, because essentially some of the countries in the, around the world are committed to providing the standard of living that their um, in residents are used to by means of selling oil and gas. And if you like, especially if you live in Siberia or something, the options are quite limited. Therefore, as long as the as long as the gas doesn't run out and as long as they can get their drilling costs down, the Russians will would want to sell gas as cheaply as they can. Therefore, I think there comes a point when we say decarbonisation. Yes, it will cost us more than fossil fuel. Habit of having said that, it should be as cost effective as possible. So, how would we, if you look at the little red square there? Um, that's the uh, that small area would provide all of UK energy end use, and that could be transported to the UK by six off 56 inch pipes at 80 bar. Um, we're not talking about fantasy world engineering here. Uh, 56 inch pipes, a couple of them were laid for the Nord project from Russia to Germany. All we need is another is another four of them sort of thing. And essentially, and an area of this of them of um, I think that's actually the, the name of the country's gone. But you can imagine there's a similar area in Morocco. And in fact, I I, I read recently that the Moroccan government are seriously considering a hydrogen export line um, for reasons which I'll explain later. So my hypothesis, which many of you will have heard before, is could hydrogen replace natural gas in the existing plastic low pressure distribution systems? Some of it up to two bar, but principally, as you'll know, it's 20 to 70 millibar. As required, these should be interconnected with, with a new high pressure national international hydrogen transmission system of 85 bar. As again, I suspect everyone watching will, or will, will know, the GB has changed gas quality previously. Towns gas was 50% hydrogen. Um, and of course, we made the conversion from, from uh, hydrogen, from sorry, from Towns gas to, to natural gas very successfully in 68 to 77, 44 million gas appliances in 13 million homes, at 630 pounds a house at today's money. The reason, of course, why there were so many more gas appliances in those days is because you didn't have central heating. You had a gas fire in the front room, you had a gas fire in the back room, you had uh, you know, one in the front bedroom, even if you could afford it. So relatively, the 44 million appliances today would be no greater challenge than that. Um, people talk about how long would you be off gas? I remember the change as a small child. Um, it didn't take very long. I think it was a day and a half. And again, I could imagine uh, a fitter turning up at 9 a.m. On a, on a Tuesday morning, and essentially your house has been decarbonized by lunchtime the following day. I think that's a pretty smooth transition. Um, an era changed over in the 1990s and the Isle of Man as recently as 2010. And I think that cost about three and a half thousand pound a house. So hydrogen is not a solution looking for a problem, but a solution to a very real and complex issue. And we, you know, you'll have seen this graph before, the principle on the UK interseasonal variation. And you can see there the way that, <clears throat> that um, peak demand there is up to 200 gigawatt whereas electric demand is typically down at um, uh, down at below 50 gigawatt. Um, and there is a very, very big difference there. And that chart there doesn't excludes the energy being used at the moment in the transport sector. So if you like, if electricity were to provide as well all the energy for electric cars, that would require that lower red line to probably double again. I mean, this is getting to be, these are getting to be very, very large numbers involving either a large fleet of nuclear power stations and or wind, but then the wind has to have interseasonal storage as well. Um, and more, well, the Asian is interseasonal, but it also has to have enough storage for, for prolonged highs and, and low wind conditions. So people often say, oh, well, hydrogen doesn't really uh, address the, the the carbon emissions problem. That's not really true. In such as a, this is a graph from the old um, uh, original Leeds H21 project, where 
you can see it's about um, a two third, about a two thirds reduction. A lot of, if you like, that a lot of the emissions it's hard to do anything about are those blue ones, which are the uh, which are the emissions associated with getting hot with producing hydrogen at the wellhead. If it's LNG, turning it to turning it into into the liquefied gas and then boiling it off here in the UK. That number can be significantly reduced, for example, if the hydrogen comes, if the natural gas comes from the um, uh, Norwegian field or from somewhere in the North Sea. But of course, the actual quantity of that is, is reducing as the years go by. Um, it's also a surprising amount of that carbon emissions from the left hand chart there also come from electricity used for, say, natural gas, for, say, CO2 or, or natural gas handling, then the electricity used in that. And obviously, as the UK decarbonises electric supply, that number will come down. On the right there, you'll see a small um, little uh, stumpy bar chart, which I've put in, which is which is wind hydrogen. Um, the detailed calculations haven't been done for that. There's probably about 15 grams per kilowatt hour, which would put about sort of a 90, probably a 93 percent reduction or something from where we are. So that really is um, a material reduction. And of course, um, I would say effectively total reduction. Um, and that, of course, is where the hydrogen will come from for SGN's first demonstration at, at Leavenmouth. Nick, and of course, the thing I haven't said is that it enables people to keep their much loved combi boiler. Um, but I'll come back to that to that sort of what I think knockout punch later on in the presentation. So why is hydrogen attractive? Well, because it's cheap to convey is one reason. If you look at these numbers here, uh, which are all from the published literature, you can see the cost of, for example, the South Wales NTS line that went that um, was laid probably about 15 years ago from Milford Haven to somewhere near where I live. That was about 92 pounds per megawatt kilometer. The Nord Stream line, which they're laying at the moment, is about 106 pounds per per megawatt kilometer. Um, whereas uh, electric uh, subsea cables are just sort of 23 times that. Even a simple Scottish wind is six times that. Um, then there's uh, you can see the probably the most expensive line ever conceived was Carlisle to Sellafield to Haitian, which was the which was um, applied for by National Grid to connect the then proposed Moorside power station. That would be 47 times the price of, of natural gas. And again, Spittle to Black Rock, um, though that one I think has been built, that's 26 times. And as I said before, if you looked at that picture of the area of um, uh, the Sahara, which you need to, to consume all to provide all of UK energy end use, you can see really there's no, I mean, the, the, the difficulty is not the cost of production, but again, I'll come back to this later, but, but the transportation. Interseasonal storage is again um, pound, pounds a kilowatt hour. You've got a salt, you've got a large salt cavern and a small cavern, salt cavern there. I mean, they're 0 0.2 and 0 0.6, whereas an Australian mega battery is still something like 406, 450 pounds a kilowatt hour. Now, I know people say, oh, that number will come down, but it's got an awful long way to come. I mean, that those are just astronomic figures. Um, and inherently, the energy density, of course, is just so much greater of hydrogen. You've got a lithium sulfide battery has got about, not, about, about half a kilowatt hour per kilogram, whereas hydrogen is about 40. So there's a, a factor of 80 there before you start. So um, a few so a bit of sort of back of the envelope calculation, which is really designed almost to give people encouragement that, if you like, that the gas sector still has a future. Before I start going into details, I won't try to defend all of these numbers too much. They all have wide uncertainties, but it gives you a feel for it in a way that, as I say, source to sofa in a way that you often don't see um, government present. So if you start off with the first column there in red, 
this is for the investment required for a to, to heat a house with a nominal peak heat demand of 10 kilowatt, which is again typically what the UK um, gas industry designs on, and which is a, a not unreasonable number. If you people over a few left of who still think in BTU, that's about a 30,000 BTU boiler. It was typical in the 1960s to 1980s. Um, obviously, with a combi, it's gone up to 30 kilowatts, but we know that's because of the hot water, not because of the actual need of, of the central heating. Um, what I've done on this chart also is I've divided the peak heat by 2.4 because people say, ah, oh, the great advantage of heat pumps is you don't need to, to put in to install the, the production, the, the, the power production facilities because of the efficiencies of COP. Well, I've gone along with that in this presentation, but as we know, on the coldest days, as we get from the beast from the east, in fact, the COP of the vast majority of air source heat pumps are not 2.5, they're probably down at 1.8 or something like that. So, if you can see that first column in red there, we've got um, an investment around about £280 per kilowatt for the hydrogen production facilities. Uh, we've got £66 for interseasonal storage. We've got 114 pounds for upgrading the hydrogen electricity distribution system or the, uh, the hydrogen distribution system, 45 pounds to pay for a CO2 disposal system, 250 pounds a kilowatt for the appliance change, giving a total of about 800 pounds. Now, even if that number's wrong, supposing that you say, oh, well, I don't believe the hydrogen uh, um, production facility, that should be more than that. You can see in the grand sweep of things, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. If we now carry out the same thing on a wind basis, again per house, but we divide the number of kilowatts by 2.5, it's still a lot more money because offshore wind farms, particularly far offshore wind farms, is not only the wind farm, you have to also lay the cable to bring it back to the shore. And of course, the further offshore it is, the longer that cable costs. And as I showed you before, um, high voltage DC lines don't come cheap. And of course, nuclear is just lives in a world of its own sort of thing. So where you come up with is that the total, you have to also add though some, 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 uh, some cost of buying in the natural gas from presumably from foreigners. People often make much of that, but it's not very expensive. And particularly for the arguments I was, I was saying earlier, I don't think that will go up very much because there will be countries that will always want to sell natural gas. So you can see you get big factors there. You get sort of SMR, you get an SMR hydrogen is a third of, of the wind option, and it's well at 20% like of the nuclear option. And in thinking the wind option, I haven't included the cost of uh, of interseasonal storage either. Those numbers that they're they're submitted, I think they're reasonable. I'm interested to see people's comments on them in, in the report in the comments if people wish to make them. I'm happy to debate them, um, but if you like, I think they are a reasonable stab um, as in December 2020. Why is conversion hydrogen cheap? Because often people put these figures up, they don't actually sort of articulate in simple fashion why is, you know, why is hydrogen cheaper? Because it can be stored. This disconnects generation of demand, no need for peak generation to make peak demand. SMR hydrogen is cheap to make because it's just basically goes through through some tubes in a, in a chemical furnace. Um, and it's just and it's it's not and it's certainly transportation if you do it in large pipelines is not very expensive and burning is only a boiler. Um, and pipes and holes in the ground are cheap, as I showed you from those um, from those earlier figures there. In fact, if, it, if this was a real presentation to you in terms of I, I could actually see you um, as a colleague of mine who has an excellent piece of cable and a small plastic pipe. And what he says is it takes this cable, which I can, and it's only, a, it's only a 300 centimeters of it, or some, um, sorry, 30 centimeters of it. You can barely pick it up. And the piece of plastic pipe, you can pick up with sort of two fingers. And that's really why inevitably the amount of copper, the amount of lithium, the amount of everything associated with moving electricity is just very large. Um, and obviously with hydrogen, you can just, you just wash out a hole in the ground to store it underground, it's been done on Teesside since the 1960s. It's done at the moment in Texas on a huge scale. Um, and the only reason they can do that is they can make money from the interseasonal cost of hydrogen. 
because of the driving season in the States and because of the fertilizer. So if you like, really, you can you can move and handle and store hydrogen very cheaply, whereas peak low uh, low carbon energy generation is expensive. That means either peak biomass stations, well, not very attractive, or peak gen sets from diesel. Well, that's emitting carbon, so that's not very good. Anyway, that's the underlying feeling I'm trying to give you um, as to why that is. Is hydrogen safe? Well. The UK gas industry fire and explosion for the whole supply chain is currently safer. It's about one a year. Uh, that's the average for the past four years. Obviously, with hydrogen, UK deaths from um, CO will be eliminated, uh, whereas at the moment, it, but CO poisonings have fallen dramatically over recent years. The last one, I think, was 2015 from distributed natural gas because there are many more from other causes. Um, just to give you a feel for it, UK struck by lightning or killed by cows on footpaths about five a year, road accidents 1800 a year. And the other very interesting is when they made the conversion from towns gas to natural gas, there was no change in the accident rate for fires and explosions, which is an interesting, which, uh, well, sometime that we maybe if we have another of these seminars on, on safety, I will talk about. But remember that natural gas has a, it has a, a flammability range of only about five to 50. Well, 13 probably, whereas Towns Gas was four to 44. I mean, so one of the arguments that was put or has been put, ah, oh, natural gas is inherently much safer because of its narrow flammability band. But again, Towns Gas was four to 44, and yet there was no real difference in the outturn. Uh, in fact, no, no difference, not real difference between the outturns, fires, and explosions when we changed over. Um, and the other plan is that where when we do convert to, to hydrogen excess flow, we'll be fitted to cut off large leaks. But that's all part of the high peak project, which I'm talk, talking about today. So my contention is that conversion to hydrogen will have no meaningful effect on accident rate. Is it convenient to end users? Well, um, there was a Wales in the West study. I think it was called Project Freedom down in Newport, which had 80 percent of, of households have the skills or money to carry out significant decarbonisation of their own. I mean, one of the theories that has been proposed and a way of decarbonizing um, the UK is by everyone becoming a sort of an amateur decarbonizer. It's complicated. If you I show you back to those need slides earlier, what cavity wall insulation is only 8% of which most of the UK has been done. In fact, there's now a market. I was rung up the other day by somebody saying, can I take your cavity wall insulation out for you, sir? Maybe it's damaging your house. And loft insulation we saw was even lower than that. You've got to put solar, you've got to put solar PV in your house, but it doesn't actually solve the middle of winter. It doesn't solve the problem as of today. So it's hard. Substantial energy saving is a challenge, is it? And people love their combi boilers. I mean, I don't out of the people who are watching this seminar, if you was in a room again, I'd say, put your hands up, who's got a combi boiler and who loves it? And about 80% of people or 70% of people put their hands up and they all love them because they don't take many floor room. And if you've paid 250,000 pounds for your house and your house is over is only 100 meters squared, um, that means that to put in a tank for your domestic hot water is going to cost you two and a half grand in terms of lost floor area. Um, and again, the conversion of natural gas to hydrogen should take 9 a.m. one day to noon the next. I mean, there have been lots of sort of misinformation about her you'll be off your heating for a fortnight and that sort of thing. And that's probably hydrogen's USP. No upfront cost, no house for people in a busy world. People will have it done to them rather than them having to go out and borrow the money and it'll make all these complicated arrangements with installers and things, which is the current issue. So is this is my message politically acceptable? Well, HMG could arrange the complete decarbonisation of your property with minimal hassle giving you a new boiler or gas fire at no upfront cost. This is the same operation was carried out in the UK in the 1960s, 70s, more recently in other countries. Initially, this will reduce carbon emissions by about two thirds when the hydrogen is made from natural gas. But then as you green the hydrogen and get it, for example, from the R or something, that effectively will totally decarbonize um, the UK. And you keep and you keep the combi boiler. So, so sorry to bang on about this, but you'll keep your combi boiler. You can heat the property when and where you want it, whereas often with many other forms of heating, you have to very much, because it's a much lower input boiler and things, you tend to have, you have to leave it on all the time, and you don't have hot radiators. 
And certainly many elderly people love, my mother used to love sitting next to the radiator. Um, and the third or the fourth option on these points is hygiene can, can heat your home, but it can also provide energy for commerce, refresh energy, and enable you to refuel, refuel your car. Once you have hydrogen in the yellow pipes in the road, going past um, the local Shell garage or the local Esso garage, there's no reason why they shouldn't put a T into that. There will need to be, yes, there will need to be a, a gas cleanup a unit on the forecourt, um, but there's a cadent funded project called, Hive, called uh, Hyper Transport, which people can make inquiries about if they want to approach us, where we will be taking um, pipeline hydrogen and making it available essentially on the forecourt for use in your car now, or, or heavy trucks or heavy vehicle. Now that means therefore that gives a lifeline for the local garage, which in many rural areas is or is also the local the, the local corner shop and very much often focuses essential of the as a sort of as a linchpin of local society. So yes, the gas industry does have a future. So what you can do? Well, you you presumably you're all from companies in the appliance trade or from uh, similar. You can create a review a hydrogen strategy for your company. The most immediate question is are your appliances that you're selling next next year fit for 20% hydrogen? Almost certainly yes, but the question should be asked. And you should also be looking to some of your core natural gas LPG products. It should be should you be repurposing to 100% hydrogen? And these could be appliances, fittings, components, but it's important to talk to your supply chain. So yes, I believe the gas industry does have a great future. But it, but you can see as the way the government is there with its, you know, 2023, oops, sorry, 2025 deadline, the industry needs to pull together and not spend too much sort of time squabbling amongst itself. So what's the likely time frames? SGN are optimistic about the Levermouth project. Well, net construction next year. Um, they got the go ahead. So they got the money. They got all the funding from that from Offgem, about 25 or 20 million of a little bit of Scottish money uh, about a fortnight ago. This will be a parallel main system, which is unique, but it's really important to understand the psychology of why people would or would not want to convert to hydrogen. Um, the, the pipe will pass, pass by about a thousand houses. Um, SGN plan to get between three and 400 people to sign up with some shops, pubs, etc., to understand the psychology as to why people would or would not wish to sign up. And again, watch this space because tenders will be out soon for all the kit that will be associated with that electrolyzer, bullet storage, pipe work, PRSs, odorization um, within the um, ECVs, meters, gas carcass suitable for hydrogen, boilers, gas fires, cookers. So the full Monty for between three and four hundred houses. I mean, yeah, that will happen. And I understand as well that, that many of the other GDNOs are also looking at, at projects because they realise that if you like, Bayes has set them a, a steep wall to climb if they're going to compete with electricity, with air source heat pumps, um, and they have to get going. And as you know, if you may have seen for other industries, suddenly once the ball starts to move, it may, may move extremely fast. As we've seen on the high street, you know, recently with COVID and and other, uh, and other, you know, other industries and things where a move online has had dramatic effect. Well, you know, you don't want to be, uh, or the, the people who are in the gas industry don't want to be left on the shelf by not providing green options. So what's key we're doing to support this transition? Well, we've paid with our own money, no grants here. We have bought a 300 kilowatt package um, steam methane reforming unit that will be run uniquely on genuine biogas. Down in the bottom left hand corner there of your screen, you'll see a little symbol A, which is an uh, anaerobic digestion plant. And you'll see a little red blob just below the Kiwa symbol, which will be the steam methane production facility. That will then ship 100% uh, hydrogen or 98% hydrogen to the Kiwa facilities in that second, that second picture there. There's going to be um, the, the, the SMR itself will be within, the ICE, within the, uh, an ISO container which in fact I went to sign off last week in, in um, Holland, which is a great bit of kit. I saw that operating at full ball. We can turn it up, we can turn it down, we can turn the CO up and all down. You can consequently 
take the num take the the con the uh, you can investigate and test appliances and in particular fuel cells on a whole range of hydrogen impurities and we can also test hydrogen purification equipment the next picture is one of us is one of an aerial photograph of the labs that we're going to convert to enable manufacturers like yourselves to hire facilities um, and we may we hopefully will also put in a hydrogen refueling um, station somewhere locally um, that that's still up for grabs but it'd be a great thing to do so um, development tangible hydrogen system demonstrator We'll have product development with odorized gas because again manufacturers are fearful that the sulfur content in the in hydrogen without the buffering effect of carbon dioxide will produce even lower ph numbers than with natural gas so that's important to be investigated we'll be able to carry out product long-term longevity tests be able to do testing of mechanical components via the via key certification scheme We'll be able to investigate low pressure distribution and pipe work, which will be a demonstrator to prove internal pipe work systems using real gases and real impurities. We'll be able to do demonstrations of hydrogen metering and commercial scale, and we'll also have, have hydrogen cleanup for transportation purposes. Um, and we might, if we're very clever, be able to do capture carbon capture and storage on it, um, which would be probably one of the world's first actual negative hydrogen production sites. The CO2 from this particular reformer comes out of a sort of three inch pipe and there's no reason why that couldn't be fed to a, uh, to a, CO, to a CO2 plant, which again, I think there's a, at least one containerized example in the country. So this is a classic example of the sort of bay that we were, we're going to build at Cheltenham. So you can see it has gas supplies, it'll have uh, hydrogen, it'll also have natural gas and probably another test gas. Um, there'll be a ventilation duct above it and it'll be uh, uh, locked off behind a key and with a key and things as you get product uh, security. Do come and see us if you're interested in, in renting a bay and, and having extended tests, re extended reliability tests on your equipment. So that was a bit of a run through. OK, just to recap, it was really why we think hydrogen has a future because it's low cost to the area you require isn't very great to make it if you go to the Sahara particularly it doesn't cost very much to to transport it doesn't cost very much to store the appliances are readily available and people can keep their combi boilers in terms of what we're doing well Kiwa has stumped its own cash in terms of buying an SMR and is putting a hydrogen research um, development facility in at Cheltenham where we can test people's products for extended periods on real pipeline hydrogen um, so yes I mean let's be helpful what we're doing at the moment we're writing process procedures we're carrying risk assessment and we're going to move ahead with with great enthusiasm and that I think Mark may be the last slide it is there we are thank you for listening I'll now pass you over to Mark E for some final words that's great thanks Mark and uh, really really interesting presentation and uh, touching on I think some of the the fundamentals there about sort of hydrogen hydrogen conversion and most importantly what does the future look like for for boilers thank you for everyone for uh, taking time to join us today as i mentioned at the start of the webinar this is the start of a series of webinar topics on hydrogen in the uk just to recap there are a number of areas planned going forward beyond today's holistic overview touching on hydrogen safety in homes in january developing safe hydrogen appliances in feb domestic conversion in march looking at hydrogen hubs in April, um, hydrogen quality for transport and heating, as Mark has mentioned in his presentation in May, and then having a bit more of a holistic perspective on hydrogen projects come June next year. Hopefully this will be of interest to you. It would be wonderful if you could uh, join us again at uh, a later date. As I mentioned, any questions that have been raised during the call today, because um, we're a little bit up against it on time, we'll compile and we'll send out PDFs anonymized after this uh, webinar. Um, so basically you can have the answers to any questions that you've raised during the call. But um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we'd love to speak to you again or see you on one of our webinars in the future. We look forward to uh, catching up with you again at a later date. So thank you very much for today and uh, we'll close the webinar there, but uh, we look forward to speaking to you again at some point in the future. Thank you very much.